Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I will be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities and elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Orion's Bedtime Stories is proudly brought to you by Anchor FM. And if you've not heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Firstly, it is free, and they have creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Then they distribute your podcast for you so you can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. So you have everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Hello and welcome again to Orion's Bedtime Stories. I am reading to you from Illusion by Paula Volsky. And this is chapter six. Elise had no time to dwell on events in Breakleg Lane. The days that followed were too busy, filled with dress fittings, shopping expeditions, and lessons in deportment. Never before had she realized the complexities of courtly etiquette. There are hundreds of rules that seem to govern every possible situation, and Elise was expected to know them all. Many she had absorbed in the nursery, like any other child of her class, but the details pertaining exclusively to palace procedure she did not know, and she did not particularly care to learn. It struck her as absurd this intense preoccupation with form and appearance, with the minutia of rituals formalized as slow ballets. Zaralen, however, explained it to her. It is in our outward actions and gestures, granddaughter, that we express devotion to our king, our traditions, and our way of life. Those time-honored rituals confirming the sanctity of his majesty's person the stable and ancient hierarchy of the royal court symbolized the stability and continuity of society as a whole. It was not the sort of talk the newly appointed maid of honor found at all entertaining, but Zerlan brooked no recalcitrance and at least found herself trapped, banished to the study for hours on end with no companion but the Count of Beaubaret's ossified old mirror of courtiers. For lack of anything better to do, she read, and gradually the rules, maxims, and precepts burrowed into her unwilling mind. She learned that a marquise yielded precedence to a lowly viscountess at the funeral of a member of the royal family, provided the viscountess's husband was one of the pallbearers and the marquise's was not. She learned that a baron whose bride's grandfather had sprung from the bourgeoisie lost his eligibility to serve as master of the revels upon a princess's royal birthday, an order of items of similar import. Much more interesting were the lessons in the effective use of fan and train. Zerelen, whose skills were unsurpassed, provided demonstration and Elise soon discovered that the clever manipulation of a trailing skirt added immeasurably to the grace of her movements, while the tilt, swirl, and flutter of a fan constituted an entire language. 
Zerlin called in a dancing master and a least, hitherto familiar only with the old-fashioned gavots and quadrilles popular in Quebec, learned the newest steps, the latest music. She learned the names of the currently fashionable composers, poets, playwrights, novelists, and philosophers, although she did not go so far as to read the works of the latter. She learned that boiled beef with carrots was provincial, while ortolan with champagne sauce wasn't. She learned to play folly, peril, calique, and other such fashionable games of chance. She learned to paint her face, and this last was a revelation. Secure in her young alabaster complexion, Elise had always disdained artifice, but her grandmother insisted that a naked face at court would mark her as provincial, if not downright backward. As usual, Zerolin's will prevailed, and a woman from Mistress Zelure's soon came with her pots of color in modern muted tones. Elise submitted grudgingly. She was scowling as they draped a towel about her shoulders, another about her hair. The scowl faded as she witnessed a subtle transformation taking place. The cosmetician possessed a light, sure touch, and the finished product was nothing like Zerolin's old-fashioned mask of red and white. In low light, the new cosmetics were almost invisible, but somehow her eyes looked twice as large, her lips inviting as never before. A single star-shaped patch on her cheekbone emphasized the white, the white clarity of her skin. Elise stared into the mirror, enchanted. Behind her, Zerilyn smiled, and Aurelie clapped her hands in delight. Aurelie had from the first displayed a feverish interest in Elise's education, which she viewed as the pattern of her own. With the exception of the required reading, every facet of the polishing procedure fascinated her. There was no detail, from the selection of perfumed gloves and lace-topped silk stockings, down to the choice of fingernail lacquer that failed to engage her attention. She trailed her cousin everywhere, from merchant to modiste to cobbler, blithely unconscious of her great aunt's annoyance, relentless in her enthusiasm. Amused and flattered, Elise made no objection, and eventually Zerilyn capitulated, resigned to the presence of the adolescent incubus. Thereafter, Aurelie received instruction alongside Elise, and the effects were immediately apparent. The younger girl started to rouge her cheeks, at the same time developing an obsession with the game Peril, whose octahedral dice and wooden tables she carried everywhere. Along with Elise and Aurelie, Kareth showed signs of change. Having inherited several of her mistress's discarded grumantes crafted gowns, which fit her almost perfectly, Carithan now altered herself to suit the new garments. The countrified coronet of braids vanished, replaced by a smooth chignon and a lace cap. She took to washing her face and hands regularly. She kept her fingernails clean. No longer did she gawk, open-mouthed, fidget, point, titter, spit, or pick her teeth in public. Her ready blushes were not so easily banished, but this was a matter beyond her control. Even Zerilyn admitted that the erstwhile milkmaid was now almost fit to attend a lady. Zerilyn's pleasure in Elise's progress was undemonstrative but unmistakable. You have grown tolerably civilized, granddaughter, she conceded at the end of a busy month. There remains room for considerable improvement, yet I think it's safe to assume you will not disgrace yourself at court. But a little more effort on your part to master all nuances of the curtsy, and you will be ready. There is not much time left to master nuances. Only another week remained before Elise's presentation. 
one week only to paint and polish herself to perfection, and then she would be judged by the most demanding, unforgiving critics in the world. Courtiers only too eager to fault her face and figure, her clothes, her mind and manners. Thereafter, as a maid of honor in residence at Bouvier, their majesty's vast Sherinian palace, she would endure the continual scrutiny of the curious, the envious, the malicious. At best, they would carp and gossip behind her back. And the worst, she Should she impress her exalted audience as truly inadequate, graceless, and plain, it was even possible that she would lose her place, for there were no ugly maids of honor. Why, they might send her packing back home to Fabec, at least shuddered at the thought, and worked all the harder on her curtsies. The days hurried by too quickly. Riddled with self-doubt she had never known before, at least would have slowed the clock if she could. The pretty face and quick mind of which she had always been vain were all very well for the provinces or for the provinces, but were they worthy of Shireen? Might she not seem awkward and absurd at court, despite all of Zerilyn's teachings? What if they found her silly and skinny and dull? What if they laughed at her? Her grandmother's acid phrase still rankled. A ruffled country mouse come to court. Sometimes she could almost hear it. The cool, exalted amusement. The covert mockery. I'll crawl into a hole and die, she thought. Impossible to confess these fears to her grandmother. Zerilyn would only scorn such faint-heartedness. Kirtha would not understand, and Aurely was too feather-headed to serve as a confidant. The least kept quiet, put on a brave face, and the hands of the clock whirled around the dial. All too soon the appointed day arrived, a warm, bright day that augured nothing but good. Immune to the promise of the sunshine, Elise kept to Elise kept to her chamber, pacing the floor for hours on end. Worn and nerve chafed by mid afternoon, she lay down for a nap, and the hours raced by while she slept. When she woke, the sunlight was already slanting and low through the window, and it was time to prepare for the coming ordeal. Kiritha helped her to dress, trying satin garter, tying satin garters, lacing boned corset, fastening, cor- fastening corset, cover, and petticoats, and finally wrapping a light, voluminous dressing gown over all. In came the cosmetician from Mistress Allures to paint Elise's face with the hand of an artist, and after her came Master Devu greatest of Shireenian hairdressers. Master Devu labored with his combs and brushes, his jars of pomade and metallic powder, his pins, clips, and curling irons for the better part of two hours. At the end of that time, Elise beheld herself metamorphosed. Her hair, glistening with gold powder, was drawn severely back from her face and sculpted into an elaborate mass of curls with long strands cascading down her back, the whole surmounted by the delicate, pale-plumed headdress. The hairdresser departed amidst squeals of admiration. Elise rose, tossed the robe aside, and Kirtha reverently draped her in Madame's Nemain's slim, in Madame Nemain's <clears throat> slim, incomparably graceful ivory gown. When the last of the concealed buttons had been fastened, she turned to inspect herself in the cheval glass. Miss, breathed Kertha, kill me dead. Elise smiled at an image elegant and sophisticated beyond her best imaginings. 
She moved toward the glass, paused, and swept a curtsy, masterful, <clears throat> masterfully cut skirts rippling and swirling like wind-kissed water. Lay me bleeding, Kertha exclaimed in rasp rapture. Elise's confidence returned with a rush. Artistry and artifice had transformed her, and in them she would place her trust. She would be a success, she was sure of it. Outside, the sun was setting. Twilight came late at the height of summer, yet there still remained another hour before she was due to set off for the Bivier. Elise resumed her pacing, picking her way with care among the boxes and strapped trunks scattered about the room. Her possessions, including Kertha, were shortly to be conveyed to the maid's quarters of the palace, wherein the queen's select attendants slept within the call of her majesty. When Elise repaired to the maid's suite very much later that night, she would find servant and wardrobe awaiting her. Kertha regarded the impending transition with a naive, untroubled optimism that her mistress envied. The gilded clock on the mantel struck the hour of eight. Elise cast one last look into the mirror, finding some reassurance there. Nobody's going to call me a country mouse. With Kertha following in her wake, she exited her room and descended to the foyer, where her chaperone, Zerilyn, waited, along with a group of inquisitive young, quint inquisitive young quint kinsmen assembled there to see them off. The youngsters whistled and clapped as she came down the stairs, but Elise barely noticed for her attention anchored upon her grandmother. Zerilyn was arrayed in full court dress. The trailing skirts of her midnight blue gown spread over vast panniers were misted with black lace. Her powdered hair, dressed over a wire frame, towered to improbable heights. Black plumes nestled among the rigid curls, Sapphires and black pearls shone darkly at throat, ears, and wrists. She had exchanged her ivory stick for one of ebony and jet. Masked with paint and patches, she looked much as she must have appeared some forty years earlier, when she had reigned as Dunlas the Thirteenth, the, the Twelfth's favorite. You are beautiful, madame. Elise remarked, almost in awe. Kind words to a relic of a bygone age, granddaughter. Fortunately for all concerned, my own appearance is a matter of no consequence. The same cannot be said of yours. Turn slowly, let me see you. Elise pivoted, gold-embroidered train flaring with calculated grace. As she completed the turn, her questioning gaze sought her grandmother's face. Zerilyn studied her minutely from every angle, missing nothing. Her remorseless eyes measured, weighed, judged. After what seemed an interminable pause, she declared, Granddaughter, I believe you will do. This, from Zerilyn, was considerable, but she went even further. In fact, I will confess, you carry yourself with much distinction. I am proud of you, very proud. Elise's eyes stung. For a moment, she thought she would cry, disastrous tears that would streak her beautiful rouge. Thank you, grandmother, she said softly. Never address me by that title, Zerilyn commanded, but she was smiling. As they crossed the foyer together, the kinsmen crowded close to babble compliments and blow kisses. No one presumed to touch them, however, save for Aurelie. Throwing her arms about Elise, she planted a fervent but careful kiss. It is your night of triumph, cousin, the girl observed. 
You are fashionable beyond words, and your coiffure is altogether killing. The gallants will die for love for you, and the other women will all be sick with jealousy, as I shall observe for myself when I visit you in the maid's suite. I may visit you, may I not? And you will conduct me about the vivere, introducing me to significant persons, will you not? Child Aurelie, mourned Zerilene. I should desire beyond all things to pay my compliments to Her Majesty, rather, Her Majesty's Lalaze. Foolish infant, enough! But Granty, suppressing a grin, at least threw her cousin a wink. The Ruvignac Landau, freshly cleaned and polished, flanked by four footmen, waited at the door. <laughs> the passengers entered, and they were off at a trot, clip-clopping smartly along the Avenue Parabo, between the rows of cream townhouses now bright with lanterns. Presently, they passed under the old marble archway, over the cobbles, and on into Dunulus Square, bounded on its far side by a spear-pointed pale enclosing the Biviere and its grounds. Past the Dunulus monument they rolled, past the eagle-topped columns, along the pale to the eastern face of the square, where the barrier was pierced by a lofty gilded wrought iron gate guarded by uniformed pikemen. Noting the Ruvignac arms of the Lando, the sentries offered no challenge, and the vehicle passed into the royal enclave. The white graveled drive crunched beneath their wheels, at least strained her eyes eagerly. The carriage lanterns and the flambeau in the hands of the footmen illuminated a broad expanse of lawn dotted with trees and shrubbery tortured into geometrically precise cones and spheres. And there, straight ahead, at the crest of a slight rise, stood the Bavere itself, a massive structure whose central section dated back to the time of Danielus the Ninth, a vast, formal, intimidating sprawl of sandstone and marble ablaze with light. Before the great front entrance, carriages came and went, pausing only long enough to disgorge glittering contents. Elise's mouth was suddenly dry. She played nervously with her gold-spangled fan and stole a glance at her grandmother's profile. Beside her, Zerilyn sat upright, impassive and impervious. Of course, she had nothing to fear, unless... Elise remembered that then that Zerilyn von Ruvignac had retired to dwell in relative seclusion upon the death of Dunulus the Twelfth, not showing her face at court for the past. How long had it been? Eighteen years. For reasons best known to herself, though doubtless involving both pride and propriety, she had not returned for eighteen years. And now, at last, an old woman, though still remarkably handsome, she had come back to serve as sponsor to her granddaughter, how must she feel, she, once celebrated as a great beauty, to display herself again after all these years? She showed not the slightest sign of concern, and yet it could not have been easy for her. Elise was not the only one with worries. Up and around the curving drive to halt before the entrance, dry mouth and moist cold palms. Courage, child, Zerilyn admonished. Only that, and you are sure to triumph. You too, madame. Ah, oh, those wide eyes are sharp. My own granddaughter, beyond doubt. And then it was all swift confusion as a brace of footmen handed them from the landau and ushered them to the door where a quartet of white-wigged attendants, clad in the royal livery of purple and gold, bowed and scraped like stiff-jointed marionettes, 
The Ruvignac servants retired, but Elise scarcely noted their disappearance as her grandmother shepherded her through the great entry, across the cavernous foyer, and on along polished marble corridors shining with gold and crystal and flame, thronged with silk and satin courtiers whose gems seemed to burn with their own dazzling light. Elise's vision actually blurred for a moment, colors melting, shifting, and swirling, picked out with a thousand points of fire. She gazed about her, a little bewildered, but she did not pause, for her grandmother's hand was on her arm, firmly steering her on into the gilded labyrinth. To Zerilan, it was all perfectly familiar, a source of little interest, much less wonder. She was scarcely wasted a glance on her surroundings. She scarcely wasted a glance on her surroundings. Only once she paused to exchange a few gracious words with an ancient footman, a shriveled remnant of the past reign, who alone had recognized the once famous Zerilen Vo Ruvignac, greeting her with a bow so deep it set, it set his old bones creaking. Candle flames multiplied in vast mirrors, glowing silks, brocades, plumes, and jewels, gold everywhere, ice slick marble gleaming underfoot, and then the great queen's presence chamber, with its floor laid out in intricate sunburst patterns of polished tile, its vast chandeliers with star shaped faceted lustres, and its high, vaulted ceiling enameled in the darkest blue and inlaid with constellations of gold. The presence chamber was crowded with courtiers, and the warm summer air was heavy with the odors of musky perfume, burning wax, and overdressed, trussed, and overheated bodies. Before the night was over, those scents would thicken, augmented by the inevitable fumes of wine and tobacco, smoke, sweat, hair pomade, and wilting flowers. But for now, the atmosphere was bearable. At the far end of the room, a group of musicians attired in matching suits of the royal purple and gold tuned their instruments. Near the center, a blue canopy edged in gold bouillon shaded the dais bearing two great gilded armchairs, respectively respectively occupied by Danielus XIII and his queen, Lalize. Elise stared in passionate curiosity. King Danielus was short and stout, with an emptily innocent face. His peruke was perfectly curled, and his embroidered suit of salmon brocade was irreproachable. Yet somehow he conveyed a sense of awkwardness, discomfort, and uncertainty. His posture was poor, his gestures curiously limp. He looked good-natured and ineffectual. It seemed likely he was a curious. Periodically his eyes cut to his wife's face, as if for guidance or reassurance. And Queen Lalize? Where was the rapacious, stupidly sly harlot of fable? She looked pretty, soft, and fervent. Her gown of mermaid green gold set off a rounded, petite figure decked in emeralds. Small features, hair luxuriant and naturally fair, complexion hectic, aspect theatrically vivacious. Whispering conferences with her physician and mentor, the Dr. Zerk, periodically interrupted the animated, periodically interrupted the animated display. Dr. Zerk, pallid of eye, hair, and flesh, was acknowledged ruler of the Queen's caprices. It was he who had moved Lalize to engineer the Marquise Beaulevere's fall two years earlier. Similarly, 
he had induced her to persuade the king to banish the Count Vaux Sobrine from court. Some said that the doctor's influence derived from the queen's dependence upon tranquilizing pills and drafts of his devising. Concoctions so soothing to her tight-strung nerves that she often vowed she could not get through the day without them. Others thought him her lover, her lapdog, her evil genius. He was loathed by courtier and commoner alike. A hesitation at the door, a brief exchange with a liveried attendant, and then the usher's voice rang out, Her ladyship, the Countess Vaux Rivignac, the exalted Elise Vaux de Raval. All eyes turned to the door, for the name Vaux Rivignac still carried weight. The woman who had managed to mesmerize two kings was worth looking at, even in old age. King Denulus himself looked up, clearly eager for a glimpse of the Madame Zara, who, in his youth, had once sinned something like a jeweled and fascinating aunt. Elise watched her grandmother, who appeared unmoved and imperturbable as ever. The face beneath the immense coiffure was expressionless as Zerilin advanced upon the throne. Elise kept pace careful to maintain the gliding motion in which she had been so rigorously drilled. Through a corridor of courtiers lining the approach to the dais they moved, and Elise could feel the pressure of eyes. Public attention, initially focused upon the legendary old beauty, was now shifting to her young companion. Elise could sense curiosity, speculation, and merciless appraisal. She heard a murmuring arise on either side. They were discussing her, she knew, probably finding fault, and she could feel the hot color burn in her cheeks. It would never do. She could not afford to blush and falter like a silly adolescent. Deliberately, she concentrated upon her movements, studied and balletic as her most demanding tutor could have wished. And the ploy was successful. She no longer heard or heeded the whispers, and her face cooled. They reached the dais, and both women sank in profound curtsies. Elise remained kneeling as her appointed sponsor, Zerilyn Rose, to pronounce the formal phrases of presentation. The king extended his hand, which Elise kissed without daring to lift her eyes. When she kissed Lalizé's hand, however, she she risked a quick upward glance, and she saw the notoriously clothed conscious queen studying her gown and headdress, headdress with undisguised feminine interest. Somehow the observation was reassuring. Elise stood to behold the king press her grandmother's hand warmly. Without glancing behind them, she and Zerilyn backed expertly from the dais to take their place among the other courtiers, and there they remained as the presentations continued. For a time, Elise saw nothing but the king and queen. Royalty filled her entire vision. She watched in awe as they submitted their hands to a seemingly endless succession of exalted kisses. Presently, however, her pulses slowed. The sense of breathless enchantment faded, and the world reasserted its its existence. Her eyes began to travel about the room, sliding from one glittering figure to the next, even noting a few familiar faces. Not far away stood the portly, moon-faced Volu Villard, whose yellow and black carriage was the finest in Shireen and whose family fortune was unarguably unarguably likewise. Just to the left of the royal dais stood Madame Vaud de Lissandre, dark and striking in her lemon brocade. Beside the Belisandre, one hand resting upon her wrist, stood a man 
with the powerful, solid build of a wrestler, only just beginning to soften about the middle, and a broad, swarthy face like a fire-hardened version of the king's, with a bold jut of nose, ripe lips, and implacable jaw, who could only be the Duke of Ferrante, profligate younger brother of the king. Ferrante's appetites, said to be matched only by his stamina, were renowned. Decisive and assertive as his brother Dunulus was vacillating and yielding, the duke was regarded by many as the man who should have been king. So great was his fame, in fact, that a monarch less trusting than Dunulus the Thirteenth might might well have considered the quiet removal of a potentially threatening rival. Dunulus, however, filled with shy goodwill and innocently certain of the world's benevolence, took actual pleasure in the popularity of his sibling, and thus the duke remained to entertain and scandalize the court. Elise noticed now that Ferrante was staring at her, his dark eyes unabashedly appraising. A number of the men did likewise, but none of the others was quite so brazen about it. When he saw that she had become aware of him, Ferrante's white carnivore's teeth flashed briefly. Royalty or not, his insolence was insufferable. At least brows contracted. With a lift of her chin, she looked away, but not before noting Madame Vaubillisandre's look of hurt amazement. Now that lady's going to hate me. Bother. The presentations ended at last. King Dunulus gave a signal, and the musicians struck up, commencing with a visuel, one of the fashionable new dances. The music, lilting and delicate, set toes tapping almost uncontrollably, but etiquette demanded royal initiation of festivities. Reluctant but dutiful, King Dunulus handed his queen down from the dais. Never did he seem more awkward and self-conscious than when obliged to dance. No other activity set off his short, ungainly figure to greater disadvantage, and he knew it. Beside him, Lalize floated graceful as a mermaid in her natural element. But the king shuffled his way through the complicated steps with furrowed brow, eyes squinting in earnest concentration, lips moving as he silently counted time to the music. One such exercise in self-abasement, his duty as king and husband demanded. After that, his obligation fulfilled. He would be free to seek some quiet corner, there to talk comfortably of hunting, hounds, and horse racing, with his friends Vaux-Liu Villard and Vaux Bragenard. Denulus's face brightened visibly as the dance neared an end. Soon the music ceased, and applause rippled through the room. Leading his wife back to her throne, the king bowed gracelessly and retired. The musicians struck up again, this time a quick, light, lanthian drenado. Almost instantly, the queen was surrounded, for etiquette and custom now permitted her to favor such partners as she deemed worthy of honor. In the opinion of the conservative-minded, Lalize abused her freedom. Bad enough that a wife and queen should con- consent to dance with multiple partners, but this might have been excused on the basis of royal obligation. She had, had she but limited herself to graying daughter, daughters and ir, daughters of irreproachable character and non-existent appeal. This she did not do, but rather selected as her partners the gayest and most gallant of exalted foes. Handsome, irreverent young men who flattered, flirted, and joked with her, treating her more like an actress than a queen. Now Lalize stood in the midst of chattering, pleading gang of them. Her eyes were sparkling, her face was flushed. She fluttered her fan, tossed her head, 
and laughed delightedly. To detractors, it seemed undignified at best, perhaps even improper. And this seeming looseness, while probably innocent enough, darkened the queen's reputation, especially among the bourgeois and peasantry, whose suspicions were lovingly nurtured by diverse enemies of the state, ranging from agents in the pay of foreign powers to domestic malcontents and professional agitators, right down to such sewer slime as the rabid journalist, journalist Huis Valier. As Elise watched in extreme interest, the queen teasingly brushed one man's shoulder with her fan. Bowing low, the chosen cavalier proffered his arm, and the pair moved off to join the throng already gliding to the strains of the Drenado. Lalize's suitors remained where they were. The night was young, the pretty queen an incorrigible coquette, and it was likely they they would all have their chance in time. Elise's attention was tinged with envy. Not a bad thing, by any means, to attract such a swarm of admirers. Of course, Lalize was queen, even if she didn't act the part, and rank conferred an unfair advantage. Deprived of her royal aura as an ordinary courtier, would she ever have enjoyed such triumph? More to the point, with the new maid of honor? In Quebec, Elise Fauderval was accounted a bell. But what did that amount to here at court, among the real gallants, the sophisticates, the people whose opinions mattered? What if nobody asks me to dance? Already the floor was full, and here she stood still, unnoticed and unsought. Was it all a mistake coming here? Is it too late to go home? What would people think if I did? Maybe I could say I'm sick? Maybe I could pretend to faint? No, Madame would never be deceived. Maybe I could just sneak out when no when she isn't looking? No doubt I'll have my chance. Everyone still admires her, and undoubtedly so. And surely she, and she'll surely be asked to dance before I am. And even as she thought it, she turned to find a man bending over her grandmother's hand. For a moment, she glimpsed the top of a silvery peruke, the sheen of a mulberry brocade coat, and then he straightened and her brows lifted, for she faced the handsomest old man she had ever seen. He was tall, as tall as Drefzina's son, lean and long-legged, with the rangy build and upright military bearing of a cavalryman. He must have been about sixty-five or seventy years old, his age betrayed by the network of fine wrinkles surrounding his eyes, the grooves bracketing his mouth, the heavy veins courting his hands, the slightly withered skin of his neck above an impeccable white cravat. Yet the eyes beneath the gray brows were still brilliantly blue against healthily sun-bronzed flesh. His features were straight and sharply chiseled, and what she had thought a silver peruke was in fact his own thick, unpowdered hair, worn long and clubbed at the back of his neck. Elise forgot her troubles, for the old gentleman before her was surely worthy of attention. He was staring down into her grandmother's face with the still look of a successful gambler. Zerilyn's expression was masked by the layer of paint. Her hazel eyes were a little wider than usual, and perhaps a little brighter. That was all. Countess, you restore my flagging faith in exalted magic. Your conquest of time must answer all doubts, observed the stranger. Time, sir, may be deceived momentarily, but never conquered. Beauty's great adversary is sometimes negligent, sometimes preoccupied, but ultimately invincible. 
In the face of that destroying power, neither beauty nor magic endures, replied Zerolen. But glance in the mirror to discover your argument refuted. What a gallant liar you are, Muriel. You have not changed a whit in... How long has it been this time? Eight years this time, four spent campaigning in Gidun, and later in the low Krenitz. Thereafter, having attained that state of physical decrepitude so wrongly regarded as the outer mark of inner wisdom, I was appointed His Majesty's ambassador to Strel. Ah, cloistered as I am, even I have heard of your heroics in the Pelarian mutiny. Scarcely heroics, madame. Desperation graced with undeserved good fortune is the truer description. Yet you are called savior of Gerencia, I believe. Such colorful sobriquets, like counterfeit jewels, are gained at little expense, worn briefly until their false luster dims, then discarded and forgotten by all. You do yourself much injustice, as always. Your present eminence is but a fitting tribute to your accomplishments, less perhaps than you deserve, but greatly more than you acknowledge. Happily for all, Vonar, your modesty does not blind the king to your merit. It is said his majesty has called you home to accept a marshal's baton. May I assume that the honor conveys high office in Shireen? If it does so, I shall be obliged to decline. The marshal's baton I would accept gladly if it is offered, but not a post in Shireen. For reasons that you already know too well, I prefer to live abroad. Still so obstinate after so many years? Always. How long do you remain among us, then? Two or three months, perhaps. One purpose in my return has already been accomplished. And you, Countess, have you tired of your seclusion at last, that you grace the court with your presence tonight? Seclusion, sir, suits my years and, of late, my character. Tonight's appearance is but a brief aberration. I am here as sponsor to my young granddaughter, who now takes her place as maid of honor. To my mind, the child shows promise. But allow me to introduce her, and you may judge for yourself. Zerilyn turned to her protege. Exalted Elise Vauderavel, may I present His Excellency, the Cavalier Fakens Vaumiriel, His Majesty's envoy to Strel. Cavalier Miss Vauderavel. Excellency, Elise curtsied. Exalted Miss, he bent low over her hand. You carry the mists of early springtime in your eyes. Such youth and grace must gladden the hearts of all beholders. Your Excellency is too generous, but youth and grace must strew their blossoms at the feet of Gerencia's hero. His fame reaching so far as the wilds of my own province, Quebec, may be likened to the noonday sun, overwhelming to the foggy mists of er early springtime. The cavalier Vaumuriel laughed aloud at that. <laughs> Exalted miss, I believe you favor your grandmother, and higher praise than that I cannot bestow. Allow me to be first in paying homage to the court's newest beauty. He could hardly have been more charming, yet somehow she fancied he grudged every moment that diverted his attention from her grandmother. As if to confirm her judgment, he favored her with another perfectly gallant bow, then turned back to Zerlin. Madame, they play the Donato, some say invented by Galiziel when he first beheld you, walking at dawn in the gardens of Palace Malesh. If the story is not true, then it should be. Will you dance once more? He extended his arm. Cavalier, I thank you, but it is fifty years since I walked in the gardens of Milesh, and I am no longer fit for the Donato. She was almost certainly lying. What she really meant was that she didn't care to leave her granddaughter standing alone and ignored in the midst of a room full of strangers. Elise's face tightened. 
Zerlin felt sorry for her, sorry for the country mouse. More and more, she was wishing, wishing herself home in Quebec, where people looked up to her. Just when she was on the verge of inventing an attack of the vapors, legitimate excuse to retire, a solid, dark figure materialized before her, bowed perfunctorily, and straightened. Exalted miss, honor me, suggested no less than the Duke of Ferrant. The look he had given her but a few minutes earlier she had found offensive, and she had no reason to change her opinion now. His expression was arrogant, even insolent. The tone of his voice, downright peremptory. Her first impulse was to refuse him, royalty or no, but she quickly thought the better of it. Anything was better than continuing a wallflower. With only the briefest of hesitations, she accepted his arm, and he led her out. Realizing that the eyes of half the court were trained upon her, Elise silently prayed for a demeanor as unrevealing as Zara Lenz. Slanting a sidelong glance at her partner, she saw that he was studying her face and figure with the same unhurried, unconcealed deliberation that had already aroused her hostility, embarrassment, and gratification. She looked away quickly, but not for long, for he swung her briskly about to face him, and she caught a strong, not unpleasant whiff of brandy and tobacco. Brunt proved an unexpectedly expert dancer, moving with a buoyancy surprising in a man so durably constructed. He spun her lightly through the steps, and Elise found herself enjoying the exercise. Despite her aversion to the Duke, she was almost sorry when the Dronado came to an end. As the music finished, she curtsied and extended her hand, expecting him to ex escort her back to her grandmother. For Peronte grasped her wrist firmly, and then he did not move. She threw him a startled glance, which he met blandly. Your Grace, exalted miss, I claim the next dance announced the Duke. It is promised elsewhere, she lied. Then your designated partner must humor my fancy. Impossible. Return me to my chaperone, if you please. Not yet. I wish it. Must I insist? Not at all. Go if you must. He bowed, maintaining his hold on her wrist. She jerked her arm, but he did not let go. She could not free herself without an obnoxious, without an obvious struggle. Was he mad or drunk? He appeared neither. Despite the inflammable breath, he was rock steady on his feet, his movements sure and controlled. Elise's eyes flew in search of Zerelen, who stood immersed in conversation with the cavalier, Vaux Muriel and totally unconscious of her plight. Not so the other courtiers, whose amused and knowing eyes she encountered everywhere. Had she been back at home in Quebec, she might have quietly ground the sharp high heel of her shoe into the instep of the too insistent suitor. But here in Shireen, presumably one did not employ such tactics against his majesty's own brother. Elise's dilemma was resolved when the musicians struck up again, this time an old-fashioned slow triage. Ferranti captured her free hand. She could feel the heat of his flesh through her glove. For a moment, she pulled back, glaring at him, then relaxed and reluctantly followed his lead. There, that is better, it is not, is it not? Better for whom, your grace? She'd got control of her face again, and her expression was mildly disdainful. Your little jest does not please me. I rarely jest. That is your misfortune, but one not, but not one with which I intend to concern myself. Your intentions will alter as you come to know me. I do not particularly care to know you. 
so much the better. The majority of women, ambitious of achieving in- indispensability, insist on plumbing the deeps of a man's character. Thereafter, their self-love is wounded when, one- when he fails to return the compliment. It is refreshing to meet one willing to forego the preliminaries. I do not understand his grace's meaning. I had thought to find you more perceptive, but with such a face it hardly matters. His grace attempts gallantry, she inquired with the suspicion of a sneer. I can't trouble myself with petty speeches. You'll have to do without them from me. Possibly there are other sources. You will not seek them. His grace appears confident. With reason. When all is said, you are an unknown, a newcomer, indifferently connected, and of relatively obscure provincial origins. While I am, Ferrante, <laughs> you are young, but presumably ambitious, else you would not be here. Thus the outcome is not difficult to predict. He shrugged minimally. There is the reality of it. The reality of it is that the Duke's dreary cynicism is equaled only by his coarse presumption. Her grandmother would have shuddered to hear her, but her mouth seemed to have bolted. The Duke, however, appeared unruffled, remarking only, My plain speaking offends you, but you must learn to bear it. Must? Do I hear you correctly? Probably not in the midst of these chattering monkeys. There is a quiet chamber at the end of the gallery where we shall not be disturbed. We will go there now, and you'll hear me clearly enough. Come. Her astonished eyes jumped to his face. We may finish the triage first, if you prefer, he offered, evidently misinterpreting the look. Your grace may finish it alone. Freeing herself with a sharp twist of the wrist, Elise turned and stalked away, indifferent to the avid attention of the surrounding spectators. If he tried to stop her again, if he dared lay a hand on her, she would step on his foot, no matter whose brother he was. Ferrante, however, made no attempt to detain her. If she had glanced back, she would have seen him gazing after her, unwanted interest stirring in his dark eyes. It seemed the Duke's attention had established her acceptability, for now everyone wanted to dance with her. No longer was she the wallflower, dependent upon her chaperone's company. In fact, caught up in a whirl of activity, she quite lost track of Zerilyn's whereabouts. Thereafter, she danced every dance, from Gavotte to Dorado, with an assortment of partners that rivaled even Lalizé's. Every gallant, and some not so young, was determined to inspect the new maid of honor at close range. They were so numerous and so varied that at least couldn't hope to remember all the names and faces, but few of them made an impression. The Marquise Fol- Le- the Marquise he of the moon face and stellar fortune, was placid and dull, filled with talk of his country estate, his new and splendid townhouse, his carriages, horses, yacht, and coin collection. Still, he seemed kindly and harmless, and when he offered to drive her around the ring at Havilac Gardens in his jewel of an open phaeton, she did not refuse outright. The Count Rouville Miseroir Vaux-Levant, whose black hair, translucent blue eyes, and faultless profile had won him the reputation as handsomest man at court, was dashing and impetuous as Vaux-Levard was staid and mundane. A poet of acknowledged talent, author of countless sighting sonnet, sighing sonnets, poignant pastorals, and languishing lyrics, he seemed the ideal figure of romance, yet suffered one significant disadvantage. 
Despite the greatness of his title, Von Levant was all but penniless, his fine appearance at court maintained by courtesy of the moneylenders. He was now thousands of recos in debt, more than he could ever hope to repay, save by means of a wealthy bride's vast dowry. The exalted Vecchi Visrar, third son of the Duke of Lysine, was loquacious, ebullient, and flown with eccentric enthusiasms. Short, slight, endlessly energetic, with tiny black eyes, lightning, a wide-mouthed, snub-nosed face, his natural ugliness was enhanced by fashionably jeweled teeth. Diamond chips had been set in two incisors, and each canine sported tiny emeralds resembling bits of trapped watercress. The least found the teeth unsettling, yet nothing could quell the charm of Vecchi's conversation, which swooped dizzily from topic to topic, but always returned like a well-trained falcon to the matter of magic. Vecchi fancied himself heir to the magic of his forebears. How true this might be was difficult to judge. As a courtier and amateur jockey, the young man could not have studied the art with anything approaching the dedication of a true master like Uncle Quince. Noting her skepticism, he promised proof to satisfy her doubts before the night was out. Then, fiendishly skillful in rousing her curiosity to fever pitch, he bowed and left her. Exalted Stasi Vokrev, slim and elegant, was the best dancer of them all. The witty Viscount Vaurenosh, almost as clever as Dref Zinosin, paid outrageous compliments. Cavalier Vaufourneau, notorious rake and duelist, had the delicate, smooth face of a girl and stammering speech. Red-headed, freckled Baron Vauplinier Vorin bombarded her with risque jokes, savoring her reactions with the air of a mischievous urchin. All were satisfyingly attentive. Perhaps that had more to do with their own private rivalries than with the new maid's attractions, decorative though she was. But Elise was not inclined to analyze the pleasure of her success, out of her success. As the party expanded from presence chamber, out onto balconies, down the galleries, into the swan chamber where the buffet awaited, she moved in a cloud of cavaliers. She drank champagne, Vaux le Levant, nibbled ortolan wings with Plumier Vaux Arène, flirted shamelessly with Vaux Renache. Then back to the presence chamber for more dancing with a glorious plethora of partners. The first sight to meet her eyes, there was Zerilyn Vaurouvignac out upon the floor, pacing beautifully through the gavotte opposite the cavalier Vaurouvignac. At a distance, Zerilyn looked a bit like a girl in antiquated costume, while Vaurouvignac seemed courtly and perfect as a figure of legend. It was pretty to see them, but Elise had no time to admire. There was Vaux Creve to consider, along with Vaux Fourneau, Vaux Lee Verliard, and the others. Her attention was occupied, but not so completely that she failed to note the Duke of Ferrante persistently hovering at the edge of her vision. He was always there, off to the side, watching her with his flatly purposeful dark eyes. Twice more he had tried to approach her, and each time she had sought the sanctuary of another partner. After the second attempt, he had withdrawn to study her from a distance, and she had managed to dismiss him from her thoughts until she encountered the corrosive stare of Madame Beauvillesandre, whose undisguised animosity reminded her that no exalted female save the queen had by word or gesture acknowledged her existence since her entrance. They were deliberately ignoring her. It was awkward, but at least didn't waste much time worrying. There was little she could do, 
Moreover, her grandmother's training had fortified her against self-doubt. Lightly, she danced, knowing that the eyes of all the court followed her, for this one night at least. Prettily, she traded amusing Rococo artificialities with her partners, and the hours whirled by. Shortly after midnight, there came a brief lull, during which it was announced that Vicky Viceroy had consented to favor the company with an exhibition of exalted magic in the Swan Chamber. Recalling their earlier conversation, Elise smiled to herself. Those determined to witness the marvel included the king and queen, the Duke of Ferrant, and a number of the greatest courtiers, all of them intrigued by any novelty. In the swan chamber, Vicky Viceroy stood beside the buffet table. When the spectators had assembled, when he had spied Elise standing among them, the young man began to speak. A born showman with a natural flair for drama, Vicky wasted little time on preliminaries. His brief introductory remarks, calculated to rouse the awe of the listeners, were followed by a half-minute still, brow-pleating silence. At last the silence was broken by an incoherent muttering. Vicky's eyes were squeezed shut, his lips quivered with emotion. He gestured sinuously. As his muttering waxed in intensity, the sweat started out on his brow. The pace of his movements built, his breath came in gasps, and a low moan of mystic fulfillment escaped him. At that moment, the light of the chandeliers began to wane. Within seconds, five hundred candle flames dwindled to tiny points of light no brighter than distant stars. Only the candles in the two wall sconces behind the table burned bright, and by that backlight, the key was visible in striking silhouette. A murmur of excited admiration arose, in which Elise did not join. She might have been more impressed had she not so often watched Uncle Quinn's perform similar feats without benefit of theatrics. By comparison, Vicky Viceroy seemed a bit of a mountebank. Staring eyes fixed upon the table, Vicky uttered an unintelligible command. For a moment, nothing happened, and then, amidst a sprightly clinking of glass and silver, a host of ornate edible confections came to life. A brace of golden suckling pigs, honey glazed and wreathed in ivy, stood up on their platter, spitting the apples from their mouths. A roast peacock, clothed in full plumage, fanned its tail and climbed to its feet. A flock of assorted headless game birds rose up, flapping their naked, crispy wings, while the pastry lid of a great pie sprang a fissure, liberating a horde of baked quail. Jellied eels began to wriggle, poached salmon stood on their tails, and a huge boiled lobster rattled its scarlet armor. Imbued with impossible elasticity, a gang of multi-hued fruits and vegetables bounced about like tennis balls. Above them all, mounted a flower-decked pedestal, the great ice sculpture carved in the likeness of a sphinx opened her beautiful predator's eyes and spread her frigid wings. Gravely, the edibles bowed to King Dunulus, who smiled, well pleased with the spectacle. Queen Lalize, obviously enchanted, clapped her hands, and the courtiers ooed in delight. For a moment longer, they seemed to stand there, alive and sentient, before the illusion broke. The air stirred, the solid forms wavered, shifted and blurred, and the edibles resumed their rightful inanimate state. The lights came up, and all was as it had been. The performance was over, and the courtiers broke into spontaneous, enthusiastic applause. Cries of admiration arose, and the king himself addressed a word or two of praise to the magician. Vecchi accepted the tribute with apparent humility, belied by his triumphant eyes.
Elise smiled and applauded politely while inwardly, inwardly wondering, is that all? The spectacle, <laughs> the spectacle had been charming beyond doubt, but minor, and the abrupt perfunctory conclusion was distinctly clumsy. Compared to the magic of Quinn's Vauderavel, the key Viceroy's antics were downright amateurish. Yet nobody seemed to know it. The faces around her were bright with what looked to be genuine admiration. Were they being polite? Or was it possible that they truly didn't know the difference between trifling diversion and real magic? Familiar since earliest childhood with the work of a master, Elise had always taken her uncle's abilities for granted. He was simply Uncle Quinn's, delightful and eccentric his feats but an ordinary manifestation of exalted talent, nothing more. The rescue of Dref, Dref Zenoson had perhaps begun to open her eyes for the first time to the full wonder of her kinsman's accomplishments. And now she saw the king's courtiers uniformly awed by a little display that would have set Quince Vauderavel yawning. Beyond doubt, Vecchi himself was innocently certain of his own success. Here he came, shouldering his way through the crowd to Elise's side, his air of gleeful self-satisfaction verging on the unseemly. Elise congratulated him, complimented him. His, her eyes were wide with the admiration that he seemed to expect. Artificial admiration. But Vicky didn't guess it. They almost never did. So much her own experience, confirmed by Zerilyn's advice, had already taught her. Scenting conquest, as he imagined, Vicky now trailed her everywhere. So too did a number of others, most of them subtly and skillfully encouraged, with the exception of Ferrante. Conversation ranged wildly widely, jumping from politics to art to sport to the latest gossip of the salons, so swiftly and bewilderingly that at least, sometimes confused, found herself relying on her eyes and her smile, which usually served her well enough. The best conversations were those whose topics, if any, were afterward impossible to recall. One piece of intelligence, however, stuck her mind stuck in her mind. Later, she could not remember its source. But after the ball, as she powdered foot... But after the, pa after the ball, as the powdered footman conducted her through the mirrored corridors of the Biviere to the maid's quarters, wherein her belongings were already waiting, she considered a bit of news that had somehow snagged her imagination. For reasons she could hardly define, it seemed significant that Shorvi Nirian's latest book, The Promise, should have been banned, its author outlawed. Nirian had asked for it, of course, what with his demands for the abolishment of exalted privilege, for the reform of the legal system, for a charter of human rights, and for the reestablishment of an old-style elected century to limit the power of the king. More was involved, of course, than the mere proscription of some renegade lawyer's rantings. Nirian had already collected a sizable band of devoted followers, the self-styed Nirianesters, whose complaints might go so far in influencing popular opinion. It was wise to silence that too eloquent voice, and therefore it made good sense to order Nirian's arrest. Elise was sorry, for the punishment seemed severe. She would not have wished confinement in the sepulchre upon her worst enemy, but there was obviously no help for it. For the sake of the nation, Shorvi Nirian had to disappear. It might seem harsh, but public safety sometimes demanded strong measures. In a modest apartment overlooking University Square in the Bohemian section of Shireen, known as Rat Town, a man worked with feverish haste. 
He was throwing garments, keepsakes, books, and papers into the small trunk that stood open on the sitting room floor. All too soon, the box was full to overflowing, too full to close, and its owner, pale but determined, began pulling clothes out and flinging them away to make room for more of the precious books. Before he had completed this task, there came a knocking, and he froze, breathlessly still, save for his hunted eyes. Shorvi, it's I, Dakiel, a hurried whisper, a familiar voice. Shorvi Mirian opened the door to admit a hugely tall and broad young man with a round, soft face, whose boyishness was deliberately offset by the addition of a bristling ginger mustache. Miriam himself was altogether in, altogether different. Middle-aged, no more than medium height, with narrow-shouldered, unathletic build, brown hair going to gray, and a mobile, ascetically nondescript face, he was saved from anonymity only by the uncommon brilliance and depth of his intelligent brown eyes. It's official, declared Dekel. They're coming for you. In fact, they're on their way. So, I'm almost inclined to stay and greet them. Do that and you'll spoil the good work of all your friends whose efforts deserve better. Come, sir, there's a cart and a driver waiting below to carry you to the safe safe house in the 8th district. One of our lads pass, will pass the word to madame, your wife. I'll take the box. Don't trouble about that. But now's the time to move. Who owns this safe house? Marianne did not stir. One of Ophave's cousins, cousins, a madame Hero, something of the sort. And does this madame Hero know the risk involved in harboring a fugitive? Nothing to it if she's not caught, is there? Fine bravado, my friend. Come, no need for concern. Doubtless this cousin feels the risk worthwhile, as do we all. But you should know you add to her danger by dawdling here. It sticks in my craw, this slinking and skulking. No, you you needn't say anything, Decal. I'm coming. Here, let me give you a hand with that box. Together they forced down the lid of the trunk and young Dekel hoisted, hoisted this heavy burden on his shoulder with disconcerting ease. Shorvi Mirian touched the pocket of his loose summer coat, verifying for the hundredth time the presence of a rolled sheaf of paper, the unfinished manuscript of his latest treatise. Satisfied, he nodded, and the two men left the apartment for the last time, made their way down four creaky flights of stairs, past the dozing concierge, and out into the street where the cart awaited. Nerian stopped short at the sight of the driver, who was a stranger. He glimpsed long limbs, a youthful face. That's Beck, the new man, Dekel explained. A very cool hand, I can tell you. Nerian nodded without emphasis, as if withholding judgment. Dekel deposited the trunk in back, and they climbed up onto the seat. Beck cracked his whip and the cart rolled off down Sidet Alley. Nerian cast one uneasy glance back over his shoulder, just as a party of gendarmes rounded the corner at the end of the street. Spying the cart, the gendarmes broke into a run. Nerian nudged his companion, and Dekel lifted two fingers to his mouth to shrill a piercing whistle. Instantly, Cider Alley swarmed with shouting university students, Nerianestas all. The noise, crush, and sudden confusion were astounding, but under the leadership of a young general, clouded in false white hair and whiskers, order swiftly emerged. Efficiently, the students ranged themselves across the alley. The gendarmes charged, and the shouting swelled to a roar, but the line held. Beck whipped his horse to a rattling canter. The cart bounced and jolted over the cobbles, down Cider Alley, then out onto Wide University Street, which, pa which bypassed two colleges, then carried straight on into the wretched slums of the 8th District. Many a citizen gaped in surprise, surprise after the hurrying vehicle.
but no one attempted to interrupt its progress, and apparently no one recognized its celebrated passenger. Behind them, Cider Alley rained, rang with screams, threats, and curses as assorted denizens of Rat Town came rushing from the taverns and tenements to hurl themselves into the fight. Few knew the actual cause of contention, but that didn't matter. Enough to see that university men defied the hated gendarmerie. The unlucky soldiers, faced with overwhelming force, were swiftly chased from the neighborhood, escaping with minor cuts and bruises. Curiously, the defeat of the gendarmes failed to appease the crowd, whose emotions, pent over the space of many lifetimes, seemed suddenly to demand outlet. At the same time that Shorvi Nurien was being ushered into his garret refuge in the boarding house of Madame Heroux, situated, ironically enough, almost within the shadow of the sepulchre itself, the mob raged through the streets of Rat Town, smashing, rending, and looting and all in its path. Every wine shop along Cider Alley was picked clean, cook shops were raided, windows and glass lanterns were shattered, and bonfires bloomed like orange flowers. Presently, the crowd exploded from the alley out onto, into University Square, where the old King's Tower rose behind the ten monarchs, life-size marble representations of ten of the present King Dunulas's most illustrious ancestors. For some reason, the sight of the monarchs seemed to include, induce hysteria. She, shrieks of execration arose, and the mob surged forward to rip the famous statues from their pedestals. The monarchs fell in quick succession to shatter upon the cobbles, but this impersonal annihilation brought no satisfaction. Stones appeared in the hands of the rioters, and with these crude instruments, the marble fragments were swiftly reduced to white gravel, kicked far and wide by plebeian feet. This done, the mob swirled howling through the square in search of fresh prey, and it was more than likely that the ancient lecture halls of the university would have fallen victim to popular wrath had not the crowd queller of Shireen in the company of his minions, arrived upon the scene. It was nearly dawn. The rioters, for all their rage, were tiring. The young Nerianestas had long since retired, their purpose accomplished. In the absence of strong leadership, the well-established fear of the queller reasserted itself, and slivers began peeling off of the human mass to disappear down darkened alleyways. Those remaining were slow to accept defeat. The Queller's masked followers were obliged to shoot no fewer than four before the crowd was persuaded to disperse. The wounded and dead were carried off, and the Queller's party withdrew soon after, leaving University Square empty save for a scattering of glass-bladed debris and a spread of white marble wreckage all that remained of the Ten Monarchs. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you and sweet dreams.